Gracias. Um, I'll be speaking in English. Uh, Canadians have the best English, you will find. And uh, the slides, many of the slides are in Spanish, so it uh, may help you along, uh, thanks to Google. Please let me know if Google doesn't work for you. <clears throat> All of my slides are under a cre Creative Commons attribution license, which means you can use them. Uh, I've copied them on here. And uh, um, you just need to uh, attribute uh, me that I was there. You must do that anyway, because otherwise that would be plagiarism. So you have to do it. I must warn also that uh, some of the images are not openly licensed, but you can use them in educational contexts. I'm here today as a uh, UNESCO Commonwealth of Learning International Council for Open and Dis Distance Learning Chair in Open Educational Resources. And my responsibilities as a chair is to support the Paris Declaration on Open Educational Resources, which was uh, first made in 2012. I'm a professor at the Center for Distance Education. My PhD is in Computer Technologies in Education. And I got my PhD entirely online from Nova Southeastern University in Florida. And uh, I've been a, a distance education uh, supervisor, director, manager, etc. We support the UNESCO Declaration for this main reason. And that is that in the 21st century, by 2025, there will be over 100 million students worldwide capable of university education and will not be able to access it. In order to do this using traditional universities, we would have to build four new universities every week with 30,000 students at each university in order to meet this demand in a traditional manner. So we must, we know we cannot do this, so we must find new ways of delivering education to large numbers of students. It is my belief that this is the main challenge for educators in the 21st century. How can we educate all of these students? Well, we can look at education, distance education. There are two ways of looking at the world. There's the scientific method and there's the creationist method. Scientifically, we look at the facts and what conclusions we can draw from them. The creationist method is here's the conclusion. What facts can we find to support it? <clears throat> it's important to know that uh, the Pope, Pope Pius XII, put out an encyclical that we have no problem with evolution, that uh, evolution is not contradictory to any Christian theory. However, the creationists believe, the educational creationists believe that God created the classroom and that this is the only way we can teach people. And uh, that uh, there's no reason to change it and there is no better way. Remember, this is the conclusion and they're trying to find facts to support this. However, let's look at the facts. In the Western tradition, the Library of Alexandria was the place where we had the first classrooms founded by Hero, the Greek. 
He founded the classroom method of teaching for one reason, and it was not a pedagogical reason. There was one reason. It's because there was one copy of the manuscript. There was only one copy. There was no other way of teaching students other than bringing them into the room and using the manuscript. It's important to note that Hero was a pagan. So we can safely say that the classroom was not invented by God. It did not come to us from God. However, St. Paul, the patron saint of distance education, sent his epistles all around the known world. He educated people at a distance using his letters and epistles. Um, we could surmise from this that God did create distance education through the intercession of St. Paul. You move to the Middle Ages and Gutenberg invented the printing press but his books were big tomes, this big, and they had a lock on them. And the lecturer would go to the classroom, bring his key, open the book, and read. Again, there was no other way of accessing that knowledge except by going to a classroom. So again, even in the Middle Ages, the classroom was not created from a pedagogical reason. It was created because there was no other way of doing it. However, around the same time in the 15th century, Aldus Manutius, or Aldo Manuzio in Italian, um, he created the portable book. That is a book this big that you could carry with you. And this was the first time we could look at distance education, that people could learn away from the classroom and they could learn on their own. And in Europe, this was very disturbing and many universities banned portable books from their collections. They did not want people reading their own books on their own, on their own time. These books were then taken by the Jesuits and spread all over the world, and people started to learn in different ways other than just in the classroom. And William Bath and Comenius, um, one in Spain, the other in, uh, in uh, Bohemia, uh, they created the first textbook. So they came up with the idea to introduce new concepts in known environments and introduce new environments using known concepts. These were the first textbooks and again allowed for people to learn using textbooks and away from the classroom. In the 1980s, these three women were responsible for the first online learning courses. Uh, Linda Harrison and Marlene Scardamalia at OISE, the University of Toronto, the, op the uh, uh, Institute for Education, and Robin Mason at the Open University in the UK. They began open online learning. So we've come today where people can use their computers for learning and they do not have to be in a classroom. Tom Russell has a website that shows links to 500, more than 500 studies showing 
that regardless of the technology or the media used, there is no significant difference in the achievement level of students. There is no evidence that classroom-based learning is in any way superior to distance education or any other form of learning. So, when the creationists push the idea that classroom-based learning is superior to distance education, remember this, the emperor has no clothes. They have no evidence to support this contention. I want to repeat this because I keep hearing it many years later. There is no evidence that classroom-based learning is better than any other form of learning. All the evidence points to no significant difference. We call these people who still insist on the classroom the educational Amish. We have these religious groups in Canada called the Amish, and they wish to live in the 19th century. They do not accept any tools, implements, etc., from the 20th century. We have educational Amish people insisting on traditional education, and they want education to remain in the 19th century when the whole world has moved on. We are now in the 21st century, and these traditionalists wish us to keep the classroom and remain in the 19th century. But today, distance education is becoming widespread and available, making education accessible to all people. Cinderella has become a princess. So, let's wake up and smell the coffee. Here is a question for you. Which is better, a course to 20 million students, to 2 million students, and only 100,000 pass the test? Or a course with 20 students and 18 of them pass the test? Which is better? And uh, we've had people say, well, you, the rate of achievement is better in the smaller class. And this is true. But with the class of two million, you now have 100,000 people who have learned the material. So to say that uh, the, uh, the rate of achievement in a class is the correct measure, we need to rethink how we deliver learning. The traditional university, what is the quality control? They quite often say, where's the quality in distance education? Well, the quality in traditional education is you take a PhD and you put them in a classroom. That's it. Generally, the PhD has no teacher training in most universities, but that is the quality control. And uh, uh, many of them, they complain about quality control in distance education. In distance education, my university is Canada's distance education university. All our students are online, every, every one of them. We do not have classrooms at all. And uh, our quality control, we use an instructional designer, a subject matter expert, and a technologist. And then we review it with two or three other content matter experts, subject matter specialists, and then we release the course. So it's an instructionally designed course that meets the standards of the uh, credential being sought. Our universities, 
they take a PhD and they pop them in the classroom. No instructional design, no support, nothing like that. Now, the internet is the world's greatest commons. It is the uh, public knowledge. It is the repository of the world's knowledge. Now I want to talk about a specific part of distance learning, mobile learning. In 1999, believe it or not, that's nearly 20 years ago, I was, I was driving through a small village in the Philippines Islands and I slammed on the brakes because I could not believe what I saw. And what I saw was a farmer in a field behind two oxen and he was digital messaging. There was no electricity in this village. I couldn't believe it. Why didn't I believe it? Because in 1999 in Canada, nobody was digital messaging. Not one person in Canada was digital messaging in 1999. And when I looked at that farmer and I saw the device he had, I realized it wasn't just a phone, it was a computer. In fact, it was a more powerful computer than I had on my desktop two years earlier. It's then when I started thinking about mobile learning. How can we use these devices to reach masses of students around the world? And by the way, I checked in 1999 the Philippines did more digital messaging per person than any other country in the world. And I checked this year, and they still do more digital messaging per person than any other country in the world. And of course, yes, in Canada now, we do do digital messaging. We do have it. I show this slide because I made it in 2004. And I was amazed at the time. I thought, this is just amazing. It's a book, it's a radio, it's a telephone, it's a computer, personal digital assistant, a game player, fax machine, camera, web browser, email, and even a clock. And you can actually talk on the phone with it. I was amazed. And now this looks ridiculous. There are now millions of applications, millions of applications on your mobile device. One of them, one of the applications is phoning, which very few of our students do. I, I have three sons, and do you think they ever phone their mother? Never, they never phone their mother. This, they don't use it as a phone, it's another type of device to them. There are two billion internet connections in the world. The world population is greater than 7.5 billion people. One quarter of the world's population is on the internet. The world is going mobile. We need mobile learning. There are four billion mobile devices more than two billion mobile internet users. One out of every three people only access the internet using a mobile device. And here's some in Africa using their mobile devices. Of course, uh, in Canada, we invented the first uh, uh, telephone with, uh, with a camera. So, Let's get real. The world economy is global. The world, the world is mobile. So why shouldn't our students be global and mobile? 
Our students must be online, global, and mobile. Otherwise, we're talking like the educational creationists and keeping our educational institutions back in the previous century when the world has moved on. This is the world we live in. It's online, global, and mobile. What does that tell us? That we as educators must design for a mobile first. Do not design your lessons for print books. Do not design them for a desktop computer. In fact, very few students today have a desktop computer. We need to design our lessons for use on different types of mobile devices. Flexible design available that is available and doable. Now I'm going to talk about copyright and its effect on education internationally. And um, I know that in, in uh, the European countries, they translate copyright as derechos de autor, le droit d'auteur. In the, in the common law countries, based on British law, it really should be translated as derecho de reproducir, the right to reproduce. It's a different tradition in Europe and, and the common law countries. What we know is that the concept of the author's rights was totally alien uh, to the ancient mind. They, they had no concept that an author had rights. People would copy everything. In fact, copyists were among the most uh, respected people in society. The monks, these were very well respected people. They were copyists. The first copyright law was in Ireland in the, fifth, in the sixth century, the 500s. <clears throat> When St. Columba, he copied a psalm book, a prayer book. With this prayer book, um, St. Finian said, you had no right to copy my book. And the King Dermot said, no, to every cow its calf, to every calf its copy. And he, he ruled um, that you could not copy anything without uh, his permission, the king's permission. Well, there was a big battle about it and 3,000 men lay dead in the west of Ireland. And from this, St. Columbus was kicked out of Ireland and he went to Europe and he spread, uh, he kept on copying and he spread the word uh, of knowledge all over Europe, he and his monks. After that, the first real modern copyright, common, uh, copyright law was the statute of Queen Anne, 1710. Look at the name. Look at the name of the law. An act for the encouragement of learning. It is not an act to protect the rights of the authors. It was an act to limit the rights of authors. This was the first common, this was the first copyright law. It gave a copyright to authors for a limited time. The United States bases its constitution on Queen Anne's law. They put forward, again, look at the title, an act to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Again, it was not a law to protect the rights of the author. In Europe, there is a different tradition coming from Napoleon's code, the Napoleon Code, or the Codigo Civil, for the rights of the author. It is a different tradition, and I believe that's the one you're based on here in, uh, in Uruguay. 
However, they all use the term intellectual property. And as you can see from this cartoon, Ooty Wooty Sweet Patootie is neither intellectual nor property. It is not intellectual property. They use this word in an Orwellian sense. It is not property. It is not uh, legally property. The correct term is a privileged monopoly. The state gives the author or the publisher a privileged monopoly in order to control the content for a limited period of time. But it is not property, it is a monopoly. But the publishers do not like to use the word monopoly because we do not like monopolies. Everybody likes property. So they use the word intellectual property, even though legally it is not property in law. John Perry Barlow, the uh, founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said, says that the greatest constraint on your liberties may come not from government, but from corporate legal departments laboring to protect by force what can no longer be practiced uh, protected by efficiency or social consent. Because of strict copyright, we need open educational resources. And I'm going to make that argument now. Open educational resources could be textbooks, they could be games, they could be uh, curriculum material, could be video, could be a podcast, many different things. The key is that they have an open license so anybody, anywhere can make use of them. Has anyone here heard of the unit of measurement called a twitch? It's used in electronic game design. No? It's, uh, well, a twitch in English is this. That's a twitch. But in electronic game design, it's equivalent to two jiffies, 200 milliseconds. In 200 milliseconds, electrons on a wire can travel 20,000 kilometers. Guess what? There is nowhere on Earth further away than 20,000 kilometers. What does that tell us? That God, in his or her infinite wisdom, designed the world perfectly for playing video games. <laughs> video games are becoming more and more important in education and training. They are very powerful tools in learning. And I want people to start looking into it. Educators need to start looking into the power of these games. Op open educational resources, uh, you can uh, mix them, you can adapt them, you can extract them, take out pieces you don't like, you can localize them to your a uh, country, your institution, you can translate them into your language. Uh, you can reuse them any way you want. This is important and I believe essential for learning. You cannot do all these things with commercial content. You can add to them you can edit them, you can personalize them, you can aggregate them, bring a whole pile of them together, uh, you can reformat them, and you can create mashups. Do whatever you like with open educational resources. You can start thinking now, instead of creating courses, of assembling courses. 
taking this OER, that OER, this other OER, uh, add one of your OER, put them together and assemble courses rather than think in terms of creating your own courses from scratch. It could be like an IKEA set that you put together, you assemble. And you can look at deboning courses. And by that we mean take the commercial content out, throw it away, no longer pay for it, get rid of it, and put in open educational resources. Now, to be an OER, you need to have an open license. An open license is one that allows for sharing. The Creative Commons license is the one that has become established as the major open license used around the world. You put restrictions on them. For example, attribution. That is, anyone can use the work, but they must put your name or your institution's name or both onto the place where you use it. You must attribute. Of course, we know this as educators, because if you don't do that, it's called plagiarism. So we must put people's uh, names down. The other restriction, non-commercial. And that is, if you, do, if, if you do not want anyone to make money out of your content, you want the money, you put on a non-commercial license. The next one, no derivative works. And that one is, anyone can use it, but they cannot change it. And this one is generally used if somebody has a scholarly article that stands alone. They don't want people mixing and changing and doing things with it. Uh, but uh, generally, we want open educational resources to be able to change them however we want. The last one, share alike, means that anyone can change it, use it any way they like, but if they add to it, they must keep the same license. They cannot change the license. Some people take an OER, they mix it with commercial content, and then they sell it under a strict license. If you put down share alike, they cannot do this. They must keep the same license. There are many different ways you can mix up those restrictions. Um, we recommend that you do not use non-commercial or no derivatives. The two recommended licenses are CC BY, Creative Commons Attribution, or CC BY SA, Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike. The others can cause problems because if you're using a wide number of OER assembling courses and they all have different licenses, it becomes very problematic. It, uh, it causes all kinds of inconveniences. And if you want to put it on the license, you can go online to the Creative Commons Copyright License Generator. And there it generates a license for you in machine language that computers can read, in legal language that lawyers can read, and in popular language that anybody can read. So you get three versions of the same license. And it's done very simply for you. <clears throat> On top of open education resources, we have an open access movement and the difference is this. Open educational resources are for teaching, for learning. Open access are for research. So you have open access journals. So you publish your, your, 
your article in an open access journal and anyone can take your article and use it, read it, learn from it, etc. So uh, that's the difference between open access and open educational resources. <clears throat> open access allows for open publications. Um, you, have, you can have gold open access and green open access. Gold open access you put into a, uh, either a open access journal or a, another journal, a, a uh, commercial journal, but it's openly licensed. And commercial journals now are charging people money, $1,500, $3,000, $5,000 to make it open. Um, green open access is you just put it online in a repository at your university or somewhere else, at academia or some other place. So this makes that your content is free to read or use or reutilize and uh, um, open access journals support this. Um, if you want to know more about open educational resources, open access, uh, this is a good place to start. A basic guide put out by UNESCO. There are also uh, this one's in Spanish. Uh, there are others in English um, available from UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning. There are also many search engines you can use to find open educational resources. And in the guide there are many open educational resource sites. So, why our OER becoming more and more important. And there's two reasons we mention here. Stringent copyright laws and extortionate trade agreements, making it very difficult for us. Um, you can look at it this way. Britney Spears needs copyright to protect her songs. We don't have a problem with that. But amateurs, they don't need copyright protection. Well, educators, do we need this strict copyright protection? Most educators, and I, I would put it at 99.9% .9 when they create content, they don't make any money off it. There's no reason why they shouldn't share. So you need strict copyright. We're not against copyright. We support strict copyright, but not in education. In education, we need to go in a different direction. It's the United States is the largest exporter of uh, intellectual products, cultural products in the world. They are pushing their strict interpretation of copyright on everybody. Why? Because they make a lot of money from commercial uh, uh, production. This map of the world shows where the royalties go from the uh, privileged monopolies that they have. Over 50% of the world's royalties from copyright, uh, patents, etc go to the United States. This is why they are the leader in pushing very strict copyright laws on all countries. They did it in Canada. They uh, pushed their law. We adopted their strict digital rights management, digital locks uh, from them. And our government said, oh no, this is Canadian policy. And then uh, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, he showed the emails that went from the, Canadian, the U.S. Embassy in Canada to our Prime Minister's office. They forced these laws on us. They basically said, do this or else. And uh, we had to accept those strict laws. They're pushing them on everyone. The other ones pushing these laws are the Europe. They get a huge 
huge number of royalties and Japan. They're the three countries that want the strictest copyright laws. Strict copyright laws are not good for anyone, particularly not good for education and particularly not good for the hundred, what is it, the 196 other countries in the world that are not making the huge royalties. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which uh, the United States was pushing, had very, very strict copyright laws. Thank God for President Trump. He stopped it. We're not big fans of President Trump in Canada, but nevertheless, he stopped this terrible Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And what's happened since is that the countries got together without the United States and we passed a new Trans-Pacific Partnership that does not have strict copyright uh, regulations. Openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. They want to control everything, what you do with your material. Again, why OER? Two other reasons. Digital locks and digital licenses. They call it DRM, digital rights management. And we call it digital restrictions management. And what is it? With digital rights management, they put a lock on your device so as you cannot copy, paste, annotate. You can't move text to voice, uh, use your text to voice uh, device. Why? This is uh, terrible for people with visible visibility problems. Uh, you can't change the format. You can't move the content from one of your computers to another. You can't even move it geographically. If you get the content in, in Canada and you go to Ecuador, it won't work in Ecuador. They stop you, um, even though you've paid for it and bought it. Um, you can't use it, uh, uh, you can't resell it like a textbook. You can, if you buy it for $100, you can sell it for $50 later. Um, you can do none of these things. They put locks on so as you cannot do it. They are taking control over our property. And we ask this question with the digital lock. Um, and remember what uh, I said uh, earlier, intellectual property is a Orwellian word. It is not true, it is a monopoly. But this is my property. I own this. But they want to control how I use it. And I ask this question, can we not own and control our own property? Have we come to that stage in the world where we no longer own and control our property, that somebody else has that? They put locks on, but we're, we're innocent. They've even brought in legislation to blow up your computer if you use the content in a way they don't want you to use it. Even worse than the digital locks, because really we can break digital locks. Hackers can break digital locks. But what they do is they have digital licenses. How many here have read the digital license when you you, you click on I agree. How many have read? Nobody. No? One person. Good. I'm, I thought I was the only nerd in the room. There's, there's more than one person. Yeah, nobody reads them, but I read them. And what the license does is say that you agree that you cannot copy, paste, annotate. You can't text to speech. You can't move the material, you can't print it out, you can't use it after an expiry date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've agreed to that, legally. And you've also agreed 
that even if their application does not work, they are not liable. No, there's no liability. You have also agreed that they, the, pu the publishers, the owners, can come into your computer at any time and take whatever information they want. This is not just information related to their application. It's any information on your computer. You've agreed to let them in. They can come in and do what they want with your information. They can, you've also agreed that they can use your personal data any way they want. And you've agreed that you have a privilege to use the product, that you do not own it. And one of the worst ones for educators is you are forbidden, forbidden to show the content to anyone else. If you do so, the licenses say you must immediately delete it from your computer and inform them. And by the way, this is a criminal offense in the United States. So if you are, if you are looking at a, a, a novel, the Fifty Shades of Grey or something, and you want to show it to your uh, spouse, you have committed a crime in the United States and you have broken your license. You have broken the agreement on your license. This, think about it as educators, that you know, maybe sometimes we want our students to share the information on their uh, devices. So it's very serious uh, for us as educators. And finally, when you click on agree, on I agree, you accept that you have no rights. That if, you're, if your government gives you rights, you've agreed that you don't want them, that you will not accept them. And I put that devil there with GameStation because uh, a few years ago, GameStation put on their license that you agree to sell your soul to the devil. And everyone agreed, click, 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 click. It was an April Fool's joke. So, this is why I believe it is so important for educators to use open textbooks, open educational resources. With open educational resources, you can copy, paste, annotate, highlight, text to speech, hyperlink, change the format, move it, print it, uh, no expiry dates, reuse it, remix it, and you retain your privacy and your digital rights. That is why I would argue that open educational resources are essential for the implementation of e-learning. The vendors, they can control how, when, where, and how you use your device. They full control over you and how you use the material. They brought a new concept into the world. You buy, but you don't get. Do you remember the world we used to live in? You buy something, you got it. Do you remember that world? We don't live in a world like that anymore. You buy, but they still have it. You buy a hammer, nobody can tell you what nails to use. Right, you bought it, it's yours. You can do what you want with it. Don't, except don't hit anyone over the head with it, but you can do what you want with your hammer. And now we live in a world, you get a device and they control how you use your device. It's a new world. You buy, but you don't get. 
David Wiley put, put it this way. When, when you subscribe to commercial content on a digital service, they get full control over you and how you use the content. They want to control everything. Now, we want to use open educational resources. How do we find them? Well, here's a few places. The Spanish ministry has put out uh, Pro Común. And uh, they have many different uh, subject areas. And uh, there's the Unisabana, Educación 3.0. These are the Spanish ones I found. UND libraries. Teaching Commons, there are others are all in English. They're mainly in English, but there's a growing number in Spanish. <clears throat> this is a primer on open educational resources. Open access textbooks, the Open Courseware Consortium, connections at Rice University, sailor.org, over 60 full courses. BC Campus, there's now 200 full uh, uh, community college and university courses freely available. Free to learn policies for community colleges, an excellent book to get started. And you can use Google, you can uh, do a special search that will only find free and open resources. And if you want to do research about open educational resources, I direct you to the OER Knowledge Cloud. There are more than 1,500 articles and reports about OER. So this is a research, it is not, uh, it's research articles, it is not strictly open educational resources. And there are many others uh, that are available. The Open Courseware Ariadne in Europe the Wiki University, and how can we participate? Well, we have a network of chairs around the world. There's 15 of us now. In South America now, uh, we have one in Brazil, and we have one coming in Uruguay. And we have them in Africa, Asia, uh, North America, Europe, uh, a growing number of chairs who are supporting research and work promoting and disseminating uh, open educational resources. And uh, uh, one, the OER network, uh, the OER Knowledge Cloud is one uh, result of this collaboration. And uh, you can see all kinds of different reports and books on OER there. There is also the Global OER Graduate Network and this is an international group. There's now about uh, uh, 20 students and about 20 professors working together uh, on OER research. And uh, I'm part of this. Uh, the chairs are all part of this. And we encourage our students to do it. And the European Union uh, has provided travel money to PhD students in OER to go to different OER conferences where uh, they discuss and share information about their papers. OERU is an initiative we are partners in, 30 universities around the world. And it addresses this problem, is there are people learning all kinds of things online, but they cannot get accreditation. This is a big problem in Canada. In Canada, we assess immigrants and we say this immigrant has all the credentials needed to come into the country. They come into the country and they cannot get their credentials recognized. Canada is an unusual country. We have 10 provinces and each province is like a country. And if you get recognized in Quebec, that does not mean you will get recognized in Alberta, my province. It's, uh, it's very peculiar and it's very difficult to get your credentials recognized. So we're addressing this problem around the world because it's a worldwide problem of how do you get, you know a lot of things, you have all kinds of uh, uh, 
training, etc. But how do you get it recognized? And what we see is that the systems that exist are unsustainable. We need scalable systems to support millions of learners. And uh, we need to do that in a way um, that is acceptable around the world. And the concept goes like this, that learners access courses based on OER. We have academic volunteers helping them online. We have open assessment from participating institutions. And uh, the participating institutions grant credit for courses, and then the students are awarded a credible degree or credential. And it works like this. On the left there, you have the traditional model. This is the normal, traditional university. Our students, our faculty, our courses, our credential. The OERU model is any learners anywhere. They don't even have to be students. Using any faculty or no faculty, using any course materials, open educational resources or otherwise. But if they want an Athabasca University credential, they take our assessment and they pay for it. We charge them for the assessment. If they want a University of Southern Queensland credential, they, they write the assessment at the University of Southern Queensland. And, uh, uh, for others, UNISA in Africa, the United UK Open University. So they go there and get their assessment done and they pay for the assessment. We call our approach the mini MOOC where we've divided all of our courses into one credit modules. And this is because the credits vary around the world. So in America, you need three credits. In Canada, you need three credits. In Australia, it's four credits for one course. In the UK, it's five credits is a course. So we've divided it up into modules so as people can get uh, their accreditation recognized. I don't have time today to go into MOOCs. That would be a whole other lecture. But there's one thing I want you to know about MOOCs, that uh, whatever shape they come in, and no matter how complicated uh, they are, what you need to remember is this, is that MOOCs were created first in Canada, not the United States. <laughs> we created the first MOOC. I participated in the first MOOC. The creators were Stephen Downs and George Siemens from the National Research Council of Canada and the University of Manitoba. And they created the first massive open online course and they named it. They had the first name of a MOOC. So the problem is, is that if it hasn't happened in the United States, people don't think it's happened anywhere. We have this problem in Canada. You, you could be doing great things in Canada, but until the US does it, nobody, nobody seems to recognize it. But take a look at this. Are you familiar with Coursera, one of the leading MOOC providers? They give you a statement of accomplishment. A statement of accomplishment, and they said that you cannot use this certificate um, uh, for credit. Well, what's the point of a certificate? It's useless. It's a certificate that you cannot use. It is just, uh, it's ridiculous that they come up with these things. Anyway, uh, David Wiley put it this way, that uh, the big publishers, they shout mine ever more loudly to convulse ever more uncontrollably and hit each other with ever larger toys. The big publishers complaining and whining and everything else. There's a big battle going on now between open and those who want to close everything. Those who want walled gardens on the internet. And uh, Stephen Downs put it this way. It's fascinating that we live in a society 
where openness and sharing can actually be considered crimes. The first thing we teach our children when they mix with other children is to share. That's one of the first basic things we learn is sharing. The Royal Society in the UK is the oldest scientific society in the world. They say that the restriction of the commons by patents, copyright and databases is not in the interests of society and unduly hampers scientific endeavor. The previous pope in his encyclical Caritas in Veritate said that on the part of rich countries there is excessive zeal for protecting knowledge through an unduly rigid assertion of the right to intellectual property. So what does that tell us? That both science and God are on our side. We are on the side of the angels. I'll finish with that and open for questions and comments. Um, that, that's a very good question. And uh, the research that we have so far is that open educational resources are... Uh, the research we have so far shows that open educational resources are as good as or better than uh, commercial resources. So um, there's, there's nothing inferior about open education resources. Because a publisher puts a C with a little circle around it, does not make the content any better. It's, uh, if it's open, um, you can do what you want with the content. You can adapt it to whatever field you're doing. Whereas if it's got a C on it, you cannot change it or do anything uh, other than follow that content. So, yep. Oh, okay. Well, that's what I was saying with the OERU, is to get credentials. Is you need a credential, a university, to say, yes, this person has mastered this knowledge or skill set, and we, uh, we give them the credential. That's, that's why we have OERU, is exactly to address that problem, is people can learn all kinds of things on their own, uh, and this is this is the problem is there are all kinds of people learning amazing things on their own not just garbage there's a lot of garbage out there I agree with you uh, but most of the garbage is commercial most of the garbage is not openly licensed the openly licensed material is usually vetted by teachers and uh, professionals so it's not uh, a case of uh, uh, of OER being uh, uh, poor quality and commercial uh, great quality. On the contrary, the opposite is the case. But the, the key is the credential. And that's why we believe that uh, initiatives like the OERU are so important. Um, right, uh, right now, it's uh, the uh, um, the different universities all over the world have their own plans on how to do it. And the way it's worked so far is that students who take uh, these MOOCs and these uh, mini MOOCs, etc., cetera, um, they tend to then join the university and pay tuition and become regular students. That's the tendency. It's been a big boost in uh, two major cases studies have been done one at Thomas Edison University in the United States and the other at uh, the Open University of the UK. And they found by releasing these free courses out that it's brought in more students and more revenue to pay for teachers, etc. cetera. But uh, um, my view of it is, is this, is uh, if teachers can 
be replaced by technology, they will be. If lawyers can be replaced by technology, they will be. But my view is this, is that uh, teachers who use technology will displace teachers who don't. There will be a change. And I think that teachers who can master different aspects of the technology and use it in a humane way will displace teachers who do not change and make that, uh, uh, make that change. But uh, it's not, you're not gonna have, uh, uh, how, can I, how, how can I say this? If, if, you're, if you have a technology coming on, the robots in car factories, nobody's gonna stop that. You can't have a factory with humans anymore. You must have a factory with robots. And um, if, if teachers can be replaced by machines, they will be. We'll have to figure out something else. I don't think so at the moment. I think that teachers who are humane, empathetic, and helpful facilitators, these are things that machines cannot do yet. <laughs> They cannot do them, so we're safe for the time being. But I, who knows what will happen? It's, uh Nobody suddenly becomes educated. It's a long and arduous journey. Uh, it is beginning. It is there. We have open educational resource projects uh, all over developing countries. And uh, the Commonwealth of Learning, for example, agriculture, training farmers in agriculture using uh, open educational resources, using mobile devices. And we just finished a course with open educational resources for training hairdressers in Tanzania. Um, so it is happening, but there's no way it's suddenly going to change things in any country. Even in developed countries, it's not going to. And in fact, there are less uh, percentage of students now going to university in many developed countries because of the cost. They can't afford it. 90% um, of our students in Canada work. They, they study part-time. They work. They cannot afford the tuition. It's, uh, it's a different world than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Well, uh, to date, I'd say 90% of the OER is in English. There is not a lot in Spanish, so, um, but it's growing. The number is growing. I'd say uh, uh, Spanish open educational resources are, are like English resources were about 15 years ago. It's a good way behind. So people have to start creating all kinds of courses, and then you can assemble the courses. Or you can translate some of the courses uh, from English and uh, use them. But the key with OER is you can do that. You cannot do it with commercial content legally. Legally. You can, you can do it, but not legally, right? And, uh, and also it has, uh, they have the locks on, so sometimes you can't even break the locks. So uh, um, there's a great need for all kinds of different training materials and different content in all kinds of different languages. And that's what the OER movement is about, is to enable it, get it out there, put it on the web, and make it searchable so as you can find it. And I gave you a list of a large number of repositories uh, that you can find. And you can take my slides off of here and use them any way you want. And you can find all kinds of material. Uh, but uh, it's a lot easier now. I remember years ago, People, that was the biggest complaint. Well, they don't have anything in my area. Now they do in many areas, but uh, there's still a lot of areas where we don't. So that's why we encourage educators to create OER if you can't find it. So look around and see is, is there OER available in your field? If there is, use it. Don't waste your time developing it. Develop something new and add it so as all of us can use that and share it.
A very good question. How can we be sure that the person taking the test is the one who gets the, uh, who's been in the course, right? Well, um, we do it much better uh, distance education than in traditional education. In traditional education, I don't know how you do it here, but in Canada, they create a huge gymnasium, hundreds of students. They go in and they show their ID and they go in and the teachers walk up and down the rows and watch to see if the students are cheating. And uh, some of the things we found is uh, students, they take a, a Coke bottle and they take the label off and they put on a label with science equations on it and you'll see students there looking at their, looking at their Coke bottle. So they're very ingenious in getting around it. What we do is we have, uh, uh, we have places all around uh, Canada and we, ha we use a private company that has testing centers uh, in all, all kinds of countries and they have professional um, uh, uh, invigilators and they know all about these tricks. Your average teacher doesn't know about the tricks. There's all kinds of tricks that students use. These are professional invigilators. They do not have any other job only to catch students cheating. That's their role. And the other way is we now have students, they do their work, their examination from home. And what we do is we send them a special wide angle camera they are fixed to their computer and we can see everything in the room. And we have invigilators looking and there'll be about 12 monitors and they're watching them all the time. And they're trained every 15 minutes, they contact the student and they watch them. And if the student is doing something suspicious, they close it down. So um, I think we do a much better job it's not a perfect job. The students are very, very good at cheating. Uh, but I, I do believe it's far better uh, in vigilation than in a regular uh, uh, traditional university. For sure, I, I really believe that. And the main reason is teachers get bored. Teachers who are in vigilating, they walk up and down, two hour exam, walking up and down and looking around. They don't want to do that. They, they've been, they had to do it. They couldn't get anyone else. And uh, compare them to somebody whose job is in vigilation. That's a different story. Um, again, I'm I'm not as familiar with Spanish resources as I should be, uh, but there are Spanish repositories that I put there. Uh, the one in Spain, for example, they'll take your resource and uh, put it on there. You can put it on your university uh, uh, site and make it searchable with search engines so as they can just find it. Do you, do you have a university repository? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yes, I know. This, this is a, the biggest problem that we are tackling now and Creative Commons and the Open Education Consortium <clears throat> are working very diligently on uh, uh, federated search engines for finding uh, exactly what you want. So as you don't have to go to all these different repositories. And uh, so it's coming, but it's not really there yet. It is still, it is still a problem. But uh, uh, people are working on it. I do believe it will be solved. And uh, I think you'll just be able to put it on your university repository and it will be, it will be findable. And uh, I mean, even now you can find all kinds of uh, uh, things on the web that are very obscure. So hopefully we'll get going. Yep. Thank you. And good luck with the project.
Um, again, a uh, very, very good comment. Um, um, we had the president of UNISA in, uh, in South Africa, the, uh, the vice chancellor, and uh, uh, he was very much uh, uh, concerned about uh, educational imperialism, that all of, the, uh, all of these OER are coming from developed countries and they're pushing them all down onto underdeveloped countries. And, uh, but the, the reaction to that in Africa was very strong. And now uh, UNISA and uh, the African Virtual University are producing OER themselves and uh, releasing them. And believe it or not, Brazil uses African Virtual University content in Portuguese. They, they publish in uh, English, French, and Portuguese their courses. And they found out that they have a huge number of people using their resources in, uh, uh, in Brazil. So the answer is for develop, uh, uh, developing countries uh, uh, to start creating as much as they can do, uh, uh, use, use their own materials and their own people. Uh, but don't be silly about it. In Canada, we get silly about this. If it's from the United States, we don't like it. We, uh, we say, oh, that's American. We don't, we don't agree with that. But I mean, really, American biology is different from Canadian biology? I don't think so. American physics is different from Canadian physics. These are silly arguments. Um, but there's a real one is, for example, sociology, where we totally different from the United States in sociology, our approach. It's quite a different course. So sometimes there's very good reason to have your own home-based uh, uh, OER. So it's a problem. It's going to go back and forth. And uh, um, I don't know which way it's concerned. I, I think there is a legitimate concern for educational imperialism if everything's coming from the north. So. Um, uh, at the same time, is, uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming from the North and other countries and make use of it. I think it's up to each country to decide how far they want to go down that road. And uh, by the way, if the country decides, that doesn't mean that the people in the country are going to decide. Individuals all over the world are just going online and they don't care which country it's from. They're just taking the stuff and making use of it. They don't care. They don't care if it's OER. They don't care if it's commercial. They don't care uh, uh, anything. All they want is they get the information that they want and uh, make use of it. So um, my, no matter what governments do, I don't think we're going to stop that. Even in China, they can't stop people from accessing uh, content outside of China. They now have in China uh, China is the largest English-speaking country in the world now. They have, they, have, they have over 400 million English speakers. So they go on the web in English and they learn all kinds of things. They can get out and just about everyone in China on the internet uses a VPN, a virtual private network. So the government tries to control it and stop them, but it can't. So I, I think it's very empowering for individuals and governments won't be able to stop individuals. And that's a, a, a Western concept of individualism, right? <laughs> thank you. Again, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. It's been a pleasure to be with you.